2 Chronicles chapter 7, for those who want to turn in their Bibles. 2 Chronicles 7, we're going to begin at verse 11. Thank you, Olivia, for that. I don't know about you, but as I was listening to Tim and Lauren do that special, I was just imagining as I closed my eyes, just sitting at the feet of God and just being in heaven and listening to that beautiful music. It was just wonderful. Very reverent, very peaceful, and I appreciated it. Thank you, Lauren and Tim. Second Chronicles 7, verse 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and his own house, in his own house, he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locust, to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be opened and mine ears attent unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever. And mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually or continually. And as for thee, if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, and do according to all that I have commanded thee, and shall observe my statutes and my judgments, then will I establish the throne of thy kingdom, according as I have covenanted with David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man to be ruler in Israel. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I pluck them up by the roots out of my land which I have given them, and this house which I have sanctified for my name will I cast out of my sight, and will make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. And this house, which is high, shall be, a, shall be an astonishment to everyone that passeth by it, so that he shall say, Why hath the Lord done this unto this land and unto this house? And it shall be answered, Because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them forth out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods, and worship them and serve them. Therefore hath he brought all this evil upon them. That's where we're going to stop. Quite a few verses there in Second Chronicles chapter 7. I want to give you a little background, a little context to what we're reading here. In the previous chapter and on into chapter 7 in verses we didn't read, we read about Solomon, who is David's son, talking about the building of the Lord's house. The Lord had said, well, Solomon, the son of David, is going to actually build this house of worship. That is the actual construction of it. And in chapter 6, which I encourage all of you to read on your own time, we don't have the time this morning to go through all of it, but you basically see how Solomon is asking all these particulars of God's with regards to, among all things, forgiveness and repentance. Just to give you a couple of examples, Second Chronicles 6.22, if you have your Bible open, you can turn back there just briefly. Second Chronicles 6.22 says, If a man sin against his neighbor, and an oath be laid upon him to make him swear, and the oath come before the altar in this house, Solomon then asked of God, Lord, hear their prayers. Would you do them justly? If they bring all this before you, would you do that? And then just skip a couple more verses in verse 24. And if the people of Israel be put to the worst before the enemy because they have sinned against you, against thee, and shall return and confess thy name and pray and make supplication before thee in the house, Solomon again asked God, Lord, would you hear their prayers? 
forgive them and let them come back to the land. So in in Second Chronicles chapter 6, basically Solomon is asking God all these things. If they do this, will you hear if they pray and, and they want to come back, would you do that? Would you forgive them? And he goes on and on for quite a while. But I just want to give you a couple of examples. This goes on for quite a while. All in the context of Solomon building the house of the Lord and him asking him, him of God, him asking of God, let this be a place where men can do these things for you. Let it be that place where they can be forgiven. Let it be a place where they can get right with you and you will hear their cries. So we get past chapter 6 and into 7 where Solomon ends his praying. The Lord fills the house that has been built with His presence. Sacrifice has been made and finally people leave to go back to their tents. They've been feasting for seven days, the Feast of the Tabernacles. We don't have time to get into all that right now. But we pick up in our text the Lord's response to all that has transpired, all that He is communicating with Solomon. Solomon asking these petitions of God, if you will do this, all of this about building the Lord's house. All these things have transpired. And as I was drawn to these verses, the thought crossed my mind, after listening to God express His love, His mercy, His kindness to Solomon and His people Israel, I had a thought. Throughout all these texts that we read, our primary texts that we read this morning, I thought to myself, there is nowhere here where I see, nothing here where I see any fine print. No fine print here. Now, what does that mean? Have you ever heard that phrase before, the fine print? You better read the fine print. That's the thought that crossed my mind. Let me tell you what it is, just some few basic dictionary definitions. Printed matter in small type. Dictionary.com defines fine print as inconspicuous details or conditions printed in an agreement or contract, especially ones that may prove unfavorable better read the fine print. There may be something unfavorable there. And finally, Wikipedia, I know it's not the most reliable source, but I don't think we can go wrong with this. Define it as this, small print or mouse print is less noticeable print, smaller than the more obvious, larger print it accompanies that advertises or otherwise describes or partially describes a commercial product or service. And you've seen all the commercials, right, with fine print. And the most notable one to me is when they talk about a new drug that's out there, a new drug that's advertised. They're going along, and everybody's just this happy-go-lucky, and it may be a husband and a wife, and they're smiling and they're laughing. And then all the while, you have this real fine print at the bottom. It's like, where's my glasses? They're binoculars. You can't, you can't really see. But they're advertising some drug is what I envision. And in the fine print, what you'll find oftentimes is that it says, okay, this is great. We want to advertise all this great stuff. But then in the fine print, you're going to see, well, it's got this side effect. It's got that side effect. And it's got this side effect. And, you know, you get so many different things. And I know sometimes medicines do that just because that's, that's what we have. And we do the best we can. And we trust our doctors, hopefully, to give us the best advice. So we understand what the fine print is, okay? But here's the point. When it comes to God and His truth, there's no fine print. God is not trying to deceive anyone. He's not trying to hide anything from you. He's not trying to hide it from certainly the church. He gave us His truth. He called us to, to receive it, to share it, to live it. He's not even trying to deceive or fool the world, those who need Him most. Why would He ever do that, right? With God, there is only full disclosure. Tell it like it is, how it needs to be, kind of truth. That's the kind of God that we serve. And so as I read through these texts, again, this whole thought crossed my mind. Where's the fine print? 
Obviously, it's a rhetorical question. There is no fine print with God because he's a God of full disclosure. He's a God that tells you exactly what you need to know, and it's solely up to you what to do with that information. He's not trying to hide anything. He's not trying to put it in small lettering. God, help us to see what we need to know. In verses 11 through 13, the house is done. Second Chronicles 7, that is. The house is done. God appeared to Solomon, and he responded by saying, I've heard your prayer. I accept this house as a place of worship for you, for your people, to come and to worship me. And God said, yes, Solomon, paraphrasing, yes, this sounds good. I accept this, as Solomon asked. But what we really need to know is found in verses 13 and 14. This is God's condition with regards to what Solomon had been asking of God. This is God telling Solomon and his people, the condition in which you find favor with me is found here. Let's look at these verses again. Look at verse 13. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people... In other words, if God does all these things, it is because His people have forsaken Him and His ways. That's all God is saying. And I want you to understand that. There's no fine print there. God wants you to understand it. Now look at verse 14. Listen to what He says next. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. And I have a question as I read these words. What does God require, or rather, what does He always require when we go our own way? See verse 13, God's saying, if you do all these things, this is what's going to happen, no fine print, this is what happens. If we go our own way, what always happens? In other words, what does he require when we commit sin against him? Sin against him. What does he require when we are living and doing life according to our standards but not his standards? He tells us in verse 14, it's so simple. Humility, prayer, repentance. Tie all this back to chapter 6 when Solomon is speaking with God about all these things. Lord, if the people do this and if they do that, will you forgive them? If they do this, if they do that, will you forgive them? Will you hear them? Will you return their land, etc., etc.? And again, we're not reading all of it. He even said, if a man comes from a foreign land, maybe a Gentile, comes to pray in this house, will you hear him? Do you think God would hear the prayer of a man who walked into this house today, who heard the truth of God? Do you think God would hear him if he was a Gentile? You better believe he would, because he wants them to know the truth. He wants them to repent. All these things that Solomon asked of God, God summarizes overtly and distinctly here by saying, Listen, listen, Solomon and God's people and all who will hear, listen. If you will humble yourself, if you will humble yourself, pray. Seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. God says, I will hear you. I'll hear you. I'll listen. That is God's promise to you and to all men. If you will do this, God will hear you. There's no fine print in that. A a man from a foreign nation repents. God's people repents. God will hear you. God is telling you exactly what needs to be done. If God has spoken to your heart and told you you're a sinner and you need me, you must humble yourself and repent. That's what God says clearly and overtly and distinctly. We all know what repent means, right? To turn or to do a 180. I love that illustration. So I'm facing you, speaking to God's people. And if I'm going to repent of something because something's objectionable to God in my life, that means I'm going to go this way. That's a 180. 360 would be turn all the way around, right? That's easy math. Or what, what, what subject is that? Geometry, probably? I don't know. 
It's math. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki, for that math, which I don't know much about. If you have given your life to God, but the Holy Spirit has convicted you about the way you have been living, or that you have not been abiding by His holy standard, you must repent. It is necessary, it is vital, and it is required of God. It's, you, can, you can see clearly with God. It's not the fine print. He doesn't tell His people, come to me and trust me in a moment, and then in fine print, the relationship is optional or do the best you can. No, He says, you come and you stay. You abide in me. You stay in me. That's full disclosure. That's everything. That's the whole gospel message. There's not parts He's telling you. There's not parts He's advertising that everybody says, oh, this is wonderful and this is great. And we want to see all this and we want to talk about this all day long. And then comes along and says, well, but this part, not so much. That's not how it is with God, God's people. He tells you all about it. Headline. It's all in headlines. And I know it's kind of a silly title, fine print, but you know, this message especially spoke to my heart because of everything I've heard going on about the United Methodist Church here in, in recent days, and really it's been over the past few years, the controversy that's been started, uh, I suppose for many years really, but it's just finally coming to a head. I had quite a few of you come and ask me last week, did you hear about what happened with the UMC? Did you hear about what happened? Yeah, I heard. I'd heard about it. And for those of you who don't know, because I want you to understand the point of the message, I want to briefly read you a portion of an article published by NPR, which I believe stands for National Public Radio. The headline says this, United Methodist Church announces proposal to split over gay marriage. That's what it's about. The United Methodist Church announced a proposal Friday to split the denomination over what it called fundamental differences, in quote, regarding its beliefs on same-sex marriage and LGBTQ clergy. The proposal, signed by 16 church leaders from around the world, will be voted on at the church's 2020 General Conference in May. If passed, it would allow for a traditionalist denomination to separate from the UMC, the second largest Protestant denomination in the U.S. with more than 12 million members worldwide. Currently ordained pastors are not allowed to perform same-sex marriages, risking disciplinary action if they do, and practicing LGBTQ people also cannot become ordained pastors according to the church's book of discipline. And the last statement I'll read to you is this. The new traditionalist denomination, once separate, would open the door for the existing United Methodist Church to repeal the church's ban on same-sex marriage and LGBTQ clergy. The short story of this is saying, the United Methodist Church is going to split because some in the denomination want to hold to the biblical standard of marriage. One man, one woman, one man and one woman, and their view on homosexuality, they want to uphold to the godly biblical standard while others do not. So the long and short of it is the church is going to split over these issues. All I'll say about this at this time on this issue is if you're going to call yourself Christian, if you're going to call yourself the church, then your life standard your personal life standard, your moral standard, where you stand politically, how you function, how you operate, must come from a biblical standard. It must come from here. If you're a Christian, if you are the church, we receive gladly the truth from this, not from what I perceive to be true or what they say is right or what they say is wrong. It's from God's holy standard. And that's where the church has erred. So the end result will be to part ways. If you're not a Christian, if you are not part of the church, 
Your standard is different. I understand that. I accept it for what it is, not that I'm happy about it or rejoice in it, but I accept it because those people too need to know what this standard is. But I understand if it's coming from a different worldview perspective or or anything of that sort. But to come from a Christian denomination, from those who call themselves the church to be dividing over this issue or to be even having this topic as an issue, floors me. Marriage is between one man and one woman, male and female. And just so you know, God does not put that in fine print. It's all over Scripture. Anything other than this standard of marriage is wrong according to God for the layman and the clergy alike. It's wrong. And God help us to understand why it's wrong. God is not silent on this issue. But I don't want us to lose focus. And I know in my passion and my conviction on the subject, I know, forgive me. But I don't want to lose focus of the real message for us today. Any sin can be forgiven. Any person can be made right with God. And he's not silent on that matter, is he? Second Chronicles 7.14, If my people called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land, which is to say I will heal them. You know, God hears our cries. God hears our pleas. God knows our heart. I found in life, in my own life, and in my experience with others, a person humbling themselves can oftentimes be a monumental task. <laughs> it can. I think that's the reality. I'm speaking from my own experience. I'm speaking from my experience with others. I'm speaking from objective truth. God says, this is your greatest need. Humble, repent, hear the truth. But it can be a monumental task, it seems. Not for God, but I hope you understand what I mean. But why is that? Because it is the first step in being right with God. Being humble means I am saying I don't have to be right. I don't have to be in charge. I don't have to be number one. It's saying, Lord, I trust you. I don't need all the fame and the glory. I don't need to be accepted by the world. I just need to be accepted by you. And a lot of people, for a lot of people, that is a monumental task. But to find true humility is truly a wonderful thing. It's saying, Lord, I find my confidence. This is really humility. I find confidence in you. It's in you. That's humility. God, you're right, not me. Lord, I repent. Please forgive me. I know this is a hard step for many people, but it is a necessary step, one that, again, is not in fine print with God. And as we close, I want you to know today, God is not hiding anything from you. And I know I joke about the commercials and let's get our glasses out. Let's make sure we can read what they're really saying. Tell us all the negative, all the bad stuff. God's not telling us anything we don't. He's not trying to hide anything. He's not trying to deceive you. To deceive you. He's trying to love you. He's trying to be in a relationship with you and offer peace in your heart. You know, we speak about the UMC. I want you to know I'm sad about what's going on. That is truly a sad thing that the church of God is dealing with an issue that is so clear in the Bible. It's so sad. Not only does it tarnish the Methodist name, but it magnifies the fact that professing Christians or accepting and embracing error is God's truth. And it's all over the news. But it hurts me because it hurts God. And that's why you should be grieved. As we leave, I want us to consider a few questions. Who provides your life standard? 
Who guides you every day in life? What do you really care about? Do you have to be right? Do you have to be magnified? Is God your standard or is it something else? Questions you have to ask every day of your life. Does it have to be all me? Or can it be all of Him? And I for one know what you should choose and I think you do too. Amen. God's telling us what we need. No secrets. Just trust Him. Just be sure you're trusting Him today. Every circumstance in life, just trust Him. Amen. Let's sing an invitation.